Hello, everyone. Today, Yang and I will be giving an intro and deep dive of Kubernetes Six Storage. My name is Qing Yang. I work at VMware in the Cloud Native Storage team. I'm also a co-chair of uh, Six Storage, working with Yang. I am Jan Szafranek. I work at Red Hat, and I am Kubernetes Six Storage tech lead. Here's today's agenda. We will talk about who we are, what we did in 1.29 release, and what we are working on in 1.30, and features that we are still designing, prototyping, and finally, how to get involved. In Six Storage, Saad Ali and myself are co-chairs. Michelle and Yang are tech leads. Other than tech leads, we also have a lot of uh, members on our Slack channel. We have more than 5,000 members on the Six Storage Slack channel, and we have various other Slack channels as well. We have about 30 unique approvers for Six only packages. What we do in Six Storage is defined in the Six Storage Charter. Six Storage is a special interest group focusing on how to um, find storage for storage to be consumed by the containers running in Kubernetes cluster. We have persistent volumes, persistent volume claims, we have storage classes and dynamic provisioning, and we also have volume plugins. In addition to persistent volumes that can store data beyond the past life cycle, we also have admiral volumes, such as uh, secret config maps, empty dirts, that can be used as scratch space of the pod, and their life cycle is coupled with the pod's life cycle. We support container storage interface CSI that defines common interfaces for a storage vendor to write a driver so that their underlying storage system can be used by containers running in Kubernetes. We also have a container object storage interface, COSI, that is trying to add object storage support in Kubernetes. And the CSI is for block and file. Now let me talk about what we did in 1.29 release. In 1.29, we moved uh, this feature read write once part persistent volume access mode to GA. Without this feature, we have read write once PV access mode but it's not clear whether it means just one pod or multiple pod on that node that can access the volume. So we added this uh, new uh, volume access mode so that it is clear that only one pod on that node can access the volume, which is very important for some stable workloads that require single writer access to storage. We also, uh, uh, added uh, some changes in the CSI spec accordingly. And the next feature mode DGA in 1.29 is node expand secret. Now that allows you to expand your volume on the node to expand your file system uh, if your underlying storage system requires the credentials to be passed in. We also have a feature mode to beta, that's the persistent volume last phase transition time that adds a timestamp to the PV status when the phase of that PV changes from one to another. We also have a brand new feature added in 1.29 release, volume attributes class. Now, in addition to resize, you can also modify other attributes such as IOPS throughput after the volume is dynamically provisioned. So why do we need to add a volume attributes class when we already have storage class? Storage class has parameters for dynamic provisioning, but those parameters are immutable, so you cannot change it after the volume is provisioned. That's why we added the volume attributes class. Now you can have uh, parameters for dynamic provision defined in volume attributes class, and those parameters are mutable. In the person volume claim, in addition to storage class name, uh, which cannot be changed after volume's provision, now we also have a volume attributes class name field, 
and that can be modified after the volume is provisioned. The feature was introduced in 1.29 release. It's staying in alpha in 1.30. Now here is the example. We have two volume attributes classes on top. Uh, on the left hand side we have server that has uh, IOPS 5000 under parameters. On the right hand side we have a volume attributes class named gold and IOPS is set as 10,000. And at the bottom we have definitions for persistent volume claim. Uh, both are for the same persistent volume. Uh, now we just uh, change the volume attributes class from server to gold. Uh, as you can see that storage class name stays the same. So when user updates the volume attributes class name from server to gold, that will trigger that volume to be modified by the underlying storage system. And as a result, the IOPS will be changed from 5,000 to 10,000 accordingly in this example. The addition, in addition to this uh, volume attributes class, this new Kubernetes uh, API, we also made changes in CSS spec. We uh, added a modified volume capability and we also uh, have corresponding uh, RPCs to modify volume. So in 1.29 release, we also have volume group snapshot that is staying in alpha. This was introduced in 1.27 release. We continue to work on it and we finished implementation in 1.29. Now this uh, allows you to create a snapshot of multiple volumes at the same point in time. And we introduced a new Kubernetes APIs. We have a volume group snapshot API that represents user's request for a group snapshot. And we have volume group snapshot content that represents a group snapshot on the storage system. And we have volume group snapshot class that defines a ty the type of uh, group snapshot on the storage system that is uh, usually defined by the admin. And we also made uh, uh, CSI spec changes. In order to support this feature, we introduced a new group controller service in CSI. And we also have new GRPC interfaces to create, delete, and get volume group snapshot. CSI migration is something that we worked on for multiple releases. Uh, CSI migration allows you to move the entry plugin to auto tree CSI drivers. And so this will be easier for CSI driver to have independent life cycle, independent release cycle um, that is from the Kubernetes release cycle. And also if there's a bug in the driver, it will not cause a crash uh, for the entry Kubernetes components. So it will be easier to maintain the entry components. Note that this feature does not really migrate any data. It is the control path that does the trick. You can continue to use entry PV, PVC storage classes, but underneath the Cube Control Manager and Kubelet will route those calls to auto tree CSI drivers. In 1.25, uh, core CSI migration moved to GA. We have CSI migration for OpenStack Cinder, Azure Disk and File, AWS EBS, GCP D and uh, vSphere all moved to GA. And some entry plugins have already been removed. Others are targeted for removal. Now this table shows entry storage driver removal. These drivers do not go through CSI migration. That means after the entry plugin is removed, you can no longer use the entry PVPVC storage classes. Uh, as shown here, GlassFS entry, well, uh, entry plugin was removed in 1.26 release. Also, CephRBD and the CephFS entry plugins were also deprecated and they are targeted for removal. Now let me hand it over to Yang to talk about what we are working on in 1.30. Thank you. 
So in 1.30, we are tar targeting GA robust volume manager reconstruction, uh, which changes how Kubelet behaves during startup and how it discovers what is mounted where. Uh, this should be completely invisible to users and even cluster admins. We just use the feature process and feature gate. Uh, so we have a feature gate that you can disable if we uh, break anything. And we actually broke uh, Kubernetes 127 when in 127.0 the feature was enabled by default. It broke some, it broke some clusters and in I don't know, 1.27.1 or 2, it was disabled by default. So now it's GA, you cannot disable it anymore, and we hope it doesn't break anybody. Uh, SGA, uh, we prevent unauthorized volume mode conversion. Uh, volume mode conver conversion is a term that we invented. Uh, so we have a name for a thing when you have a snapshot of raw block volume and you restore it as a file system volume. So Kubelet will then mount it. Uh, we call this uh, thing volume conversion and we want to prevent uh, people from doing it, regular users, because converting a block volume into a file system volume and mounting it, it could have security implications. So only trusted users should be able to do that and trusted software. So if you or your software needs to convert Roblox volumes, Roblox volume snapshots into file system volumes, then please read this cap. Uh, if you use sidecars with these versions, external snapshotter, external provisioner, uh, you, will, your, you or your software will need additional permissions and also the software will need to do a uh, special annotation on volume snapshot content. Regular users uh, should not worry at all because they should not convert raw block volumes into file system volumes. Uh, as alpha, we are continuing with improving as Linux labeling speed ups. So if you have a Linux distro that has as Linux, uh, Linux enabled, then every time uh, you start a pod, uh, the container runtime will re recursively relabel the whole volume that the pod uses. It will go through all the volumes, all the directories on all those volumes. It will set the right as Linux labels on, the, on all the files on the volume. That can be slow. So we are trying to speed it up using mount options. In Kubernetes 129, uh, we had a beta implementation for read write once pod volumes because uh, using these volumes, it cannot break anybody. So it's enabled by default, it should just work and you should not notice any difference. However, uh, we are extending this mount option support to all the volumes and there could be corner cases when you share a volume among several pods and each of them has different asynchronous context so this is alpha, this is disabled by default. We are doing for testing. It will stay disabled for a release, maybe two. And if you run uh, Kubernetes with Linux enabled, I strongly encourage to talk to me or to test this feature while it's alpha because it can really break some workloads. And uh, container storage object interface, it stays as alpha. And in design and prototyping, we have a couple of other features. The first one is storage capacity scoring. If you remember Kubernetes 124, I believe, we introduced uh, storage capacity tracking when uh, we track uh, how much free capacity is on each node for dynamic provisioning of local volumes. Typically, if you use Topo LVM, this is the thing, how Topo LVM tells a scheduler how much free capacity is on each node. So when scheduler picks a node for a workload, uh, it can pick a node that has some capacity. We are improving this with capacity scoring. The scheduler will not pick any node with free capacity. It will pick the best node with free capacity. What is the best capacity? 
it's written in the cap. And if you have any opinion, what is the best capacity for scheduling of local storage, please read the cap uh, and say your opinion, because now is the right time to influence the cap. And we are also trying to combine CSA sidecars into a single sidecar. So the external attacher, external provisioner, resizer, snapshotter, we are trying to merge them into single Git repository. The primary motivation for us is to save some maintenance costs. So we will maintain one repository instead of many. But also, uh, if we have a single sidecar, we can save some memory during runtime. We can save some CPU. We can share all the informers. It could be also more comfortable for CSI driver vendors to have just one sidecar instead of four. And last but not least, uh, what is in prototyping is change block tracking. Uh, it is an attempt to help backup software to take incremental backups easier. The expected workflow is that the backup software takes a snapshot of a volume. It takes a full backup of that volume. No changes there. But when they take a second snapshot of the same volume, they can ask the CSI driver what blocks are changed between these two snapshots. And the CSI driver just reports uh, IDs of those blocks and the backup software backups only those blocks and saves a lot of space and network traffic. For that, we introduced a new CS9 snapshot metadata gRPC service uh, that the backup, service, uh, the backup software will talk to the CSI driver. It will, it will be a regular service in Kubernetes. Uh, and we also introduced external snapshot metadata sidecar. At least initially, it's going to be a new sidecar. There will be us use, exposing this uh, gRPC service. It will do authentication, authorization, encryption, everything uh, using uh, Kubernetes RBAC rules. Uh, so the CSI driver will just implement new CSI call to get the diff between snapshots and doesn't need to worry about TLS and authorization and anything. So at least initially, it's going to be a separate sidecar. So uh, we can rapidly prototype, we can release new versions quickly. We don't need to worry about other sidecars, but eventually we hope it's going to merge into this uh, common sidecar. So that was for features. How can you get involved? Uh, the best is to look at our landing page uh, that has all the links, all the work groups that uh, we have, all the meetings. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of meetings, I would say. Uh, the main meeting happens every two weeks uh, for overall six storage. We, we track all the features and we also have time for any discussion. It happens twice a week on Thursday morning Pacific time. We have a weekly issue triage meeting again. Uh, morning Pacific time, now on Wednesday. Uh, and we would uh, gladly welcome any contributors here because we have far more issues that we can fix. Uh, we, on these meetings, we usually go through the issues. We can see, okay, we, we acknowledge it's an issue, but we put it into backlog because we don't have anybody to fix them. <laughs> so any contribution uh, would be welcome. Don't be afraid to join. We can find some easy issues, but most of the easy issues are fixed. Like we have hard problems to fix, but we can help you. We can do some mentoring. We can, we can find something, don't worry. And uh, all, all sub projects and uh, work groups, they have their own meetings. We have a weekly cozy meeting on Wednesday, weekly CSI meeting on Monday and bi-weekly data protection meeting on Thursday, I believe. All of them morning Pacific time. Uh, eve, late evening, uh, sorry, late, late afternoon, early meeting, European time. Uh, we have a mailing list uh, that is not very used because everybody's on Slack. So we have a couple of Slack channels. And that's basically all. Uh, here are just uh, some links for further study if you want. Uh, this is available for download in the schedule. And here is a link for or QR code for any uh, feedback you have for this session. 
So, any questions? If you have a question, please, there is a microphone. Don't be shy. Okay, I, I'll get started. Very interesting, uh, all the information. I was wondering about the volume snapshots, if there is a way, if there is already, I definitely missed it, but I looked for it, didn't find a way to report the real size used by a snapshot, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's not there yet. Okay, well, it would be extremely welcome to have, if I may say, because if you yeah, take a multi-terabyte snapshot and that is using a few gigabytes, you just really don't know. Yeah, I think storage system has a way to report that, but uh, uh, currently, we do not we do not have that. We did discuss a little bit actually in one of those meetings. Um, have not reached consensus like everybody wants it. But if you, um, yeah, if you think this is very important, we can definitely talk about this again. Uh, one thing about snapshot size is that it tends to grow. If you take a snapshot yep. and you write to the original volume, then the snapshot grows. So it's hard to report the size actually. And that was the contention point when we discussed it on, on our meetings. So because nobody knew how to solve it and how to report it like at least somehow accurate. Uh, well, actually, well, yeah, so it's hard to, to just report snapshot size for like one individual snapshot, but actually you can actually report like total snapshot for the one volume. It can get changed, you know, the whole snapshot uh, chain. But there was actually a way for the online storage system to report that. But I know it's difficult. I think some storage vendor may have concerns regarding performance. Um, but we can definitely talk about that because we do have to solve this problem for our own product. We did have a solution, but it's, we need to, of course, uh, for the whole community, we need to have a consensus, right, if we want to solve it uh, for, with a common API. Yeah. Well, if, if, if anything serves for, uh, for us, uh, we're running databases, so it's, it's quite important to support snapshots well and to inform the user of the size of the snapshots. Definitely it's dynamic, it's obviously changing over time, so I may rephrase my statement of more than uh, reporting it, being able to query, because the, the drivers they know, or they may know, right? And this is uh, in very valuable information. Happy to share more details conversation if you want, but for my side, a plus one or plus a hundred for this feature. So you basically just want to be able to have a way to query it after that has been created. Yes, exactly. Right, and uh, but even that query, well, it's going to affect the performance even if you query it, that call alone. But that's not an issue for you, you think? No, it's not. It, okay. Yeah. All right, yeah, I think we should Definitely talk about that again. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to provide feedback. Because I, I do know I do know that definitely there's a problem because we're not counting that towards your quota, right? The quota is only for the persistent volumes, but your snapshot is still taking space, but <laughs> we don't really count them. Uh, that's definitely a problem. You can actually can run out of space. Yeah, yeah, abso absolutely. Yeah. That may happen, of course. Yeah. yeah. And if I, may, I don't see a big queue behind me, so <laughs> I may take a second one if that's okay. Uh, maybe this is not exactly related to, to SIG storage, correct me if I'm wrong. It's more about the snapshotter process. If there is any plans to add the capability of adding, let's say, a layer on the container image while the container is running. That's more question for container runtime than for storage. Uh, I don't know about such plans, to yeah, be honest. I haven't heard either. Yeah. Uh, I would talk to Signode. Okay, yeah, and fair enough. Because that's really container runtime problem. They, they need to have this support in container runtime interface. Yeah, and the snapshotter. That's why I was here. But okay. Well, you don't take snapshots of these container layers. Do you want to snapshot them? And why? No, just to add another layer. Let's say I want to add some, um, in my particular case, um, in databases in Postgres, we have extensions, which are kind of plugins to the database. You can add new function and new, new, like a plugin to the browser, right, for the database. And we don't want to ship a container with 200 extensions because that's a security nightmare. Mm -hmm. Instead, we want to add them dynamically. And one option would be to say, okay, I have now zero extensions. Now I want one extensions and they 
could be provided as an additional container layer, then I want to add mm -hmm. it. I don't want to restart the container. That means bringing down my database. That's, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely for a node team. OK, OK, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I just want to know, please, uh, why COSI remains in alpha release? <laughs> because we lack volunteers. <laughs> Yeah, so we actually have weekly meetings. If you are interested, uh, you can join that meeting. If you can, uh, if you can help, that would be great. Well, we really just need, we need uh, people to work on it. Uh, we do have a, a few people. I don't know if uh, Blaine is here today. And there's also Matthews who are on the team. Oh, hi. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, Matthews, he is uh, working on it. He's, uh, he uh, uh, has a test plan, right? We are trying to add some tests. Because to move it to beta, you need to have the, you know, you need to set up the pipeline, you need to have E2E tests and all of that. So he's working on that. And uh, Blaine is working on updating the cap, filling out the production readiness reviews. So all of those are steps that are needed for us to move to beta. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No other questions? Everything works. Everybody understands everything. All right, well, job well done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>